there are persistent lack of transparency and accountability in the spending of public funds, has raised concerns of financial trust amongst Nigerians. On the 8th of January 2024, President Tinubu suspended the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation over when a leaked memo dated December 20, 2023 to the Accountant General of the Federation requesting the disbursement of 585 million naira meant for grants for vulnerable groups to a personal account surfaced online. However, the action of the Minister was against Chapter 7, Section 713 of the Federal Government's Financial Regulations 2009, which notes, personal money shall in no circumstances be paid into a government bank account, nor shall any public money be paid into a private account. In light of this, some Nigerians have expressed diverse opinions. It was said that the act is a reflection of corruption in the system. The case at hand is something that is not new when it concerns Nigeria as a country because uh, the system has already gone bad. These are one of the things we have been saying. You know, when we talk about corruption, corruption has become a norm. You know, what I'm saying that is that she has tried to justify her actions. Due to the past incident and situations and things that have happened in the previously, believe that such actions can lead to, uh, to some negative results. As a government officials, the act is unacceptable. So to me, she has to be removed from that office entirely because it's, it's, it's a, as in that act is, is not good. It's not a good thing. To fight against corruption, Gabriel Adoga, a businessman, said this is an opportunity for President Tinubu's administration to keep to their promise of transparency and accountability, and a request for proper investigation. President Tinubu has an opportunity to tell Nigeria that he's serious about the fight against corruption, to show everybody now that he means well to do something because these are serious allegations and okay so we expect something to be done if you check what is happening in the country and what nigerians are going through you'll we'll find out that the elite has not been fair to nigeria and if until we rebuke the elite for doing wrong we cannot reprimand those on the street or the common man as we put it as the government have a legal obligation to probe and persecutes allegations of abuse of office and corruption in the spending of public funds meant to improve the conditions of the vulnerables. Nigerians hope that the case will be well addressed to accord the system credibility, transparency, and accountability in governance. Victoria Ayonude, Kaftan TV News. Um, and giving them a, a platform mm. where they can participate at a global, especially at a global marketplace, mm. it's, and especially in the creative sector. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like you said, uh, you know, women are really left behind. And I think one of the things that has been very glaring to me, um, interacting with people within the space, is that yes, there are women that have the talent, yes. but I think um, they have not really been carried along in, in, in a way that would really represent you, you, um, a lot of the technical aspects. It's all men, and women yeah. can do it as well. So it, it's good to to sort of close the close that gap, you know, and give the um, that opportunity. It's one of the uh, uh, um, one of the main um, main uh, one of the one of the main uh, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, for him, one of his main objectives was that, you know, he would try to close the gap, the gender gap. And, you know, he really wants us to do what we can uh, to see how we can sort of empower not only women, but uh, young people, or people of a younger demographic, and uh, even the physically challenged, the disabled. So I think this is one way that we can do that. In this conversation first taking a quote from frederick netke he once said whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster 
And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Oh, wow. That's deep. Okay, my next quote will be from Mahatma Gandhi. Everyone loves and knows Mahatma Gandhi. Now, he once said, I will not let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet. Okay. Very warm greetings and welcome to The Conversation. We're reaching you from Kafans Television Studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabelle Oji. It is good to hear and to um, see you all today. So today we will be discussing fighting corruption, especially in Nigeria. Most people said there's this new um, wind of anti-corruption that is blowing and that has been blowing since a few days ago. What exactly is happening? My guest on the show to help us discuss this and more is Teve Atsa, who is a former governorship aspirant in um, Benue State. That's for PDP. It's great to hear from you today, sir. Thank you very much for having me on your awesome. show. Happy New Year. I'm sure we've not heard from you throughout this year. No, oh, yeah. Happy New Year. Uh, how is Abuja doing? Abuja is treating us well. Even apart from the insecurity that we are saying now. Now, let's, since we're talking about insecurity, now wow. let's start from insecurity. What are your thoughts with regards to insecurity? Because I remember we had some conversation before last, late, late, last year, and then we've been having like a review of um, all that happened in 2023. Now, coming back, coming now to 2024, we're just a few days earlier, and then we're, still, we're already talking about incessant um, armed robbery, incessant insecurity, especially in the federal capital territory. Most people now live in fear because in their own houses, they are being kidnapped, they're being robbed. They're, I've heard so many, and I'm trying not to, I'm trying to make it look, uh, to sound as easy as, as I can, but... It's really, really not as easy as it is. What exactly do you think is going on? Even though we have a new sheriff, he's, he's over um, three months, but we still have a new landlord, though. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, security is uh, a factor of uh, how economically secured the people are. When there is a breakdown in physical security, it is a symptom of a more fundamental insecurity. Mm. And that is economic insecurity. When people are not economically secured, the violent crimes become inevitable because people don't have legitimate ways of making their ends meet. So they have to go for the illegitimate means to make their ends meet. So there, these are some of the issues that we are having. There's an interplay with between the economy and security, which most of the times we miss. We tend to assume that it is a security architecture. I hear people talking about security architecture. There is no security architecture without an economic architecture. So the government must marry these two. Um, towards the end of the year, you know that was a festive season. In our parts, people believe that even if you have not made money throughout the year, you must make some money during December mm. so that you can spend it on Christmas and New Year. So most criminals uh, take uh, this time as a time they must operate. But this is January already. So insecurity normally increases. Yeah, well, January is just ending. Most people are paying school fees now. Children are going back to school. Mm. So a lot of people are under pressure. So some must find means of uh, getting money. Anyhow, anyhow, they must get it. But apart from that, there's another angle which many people may not agree with me, but I am convinced that a change in gas can also lead to insecurity. Can you explain I, that, please? I registered a company. Okay. 
the change in guard can lead to insecurity. Let me give you an example of what happened recently. Okay. I registered a company under the Corporate Affairs Commission. And in the process of issuing me a certificate, they made a mistake. And uh, my lawyer wrote to them asking for a correction. But we were told that the new Registrar General has just been appointed and he's trying to settle down. Mm. So he's not attending to issues. So while he was settling down, things were happening. Things were going wrong. So I know there was a change in the leadership of the army, the police. So many new people were appointed in high command. And they were reshuffling here and there. The people were trying to settle down. So when they're about to settle down, they take their eyes off the guard. So things go wrong because the down command are waiting for them to give directions. They are waiting for the new sheriff to set mm. a new tone. Mm. So the other ranks, they may lay down their guards. So to me, after serious analysis, I, I realized that when there's a change in the high command, when there is movement of very high profile military officers to different uh, assignments, they take some time to rearrange themselves. And why that is happening, things go wrong. So the heightened insecurity, especially around Abuja, is not unconnected with these two factors, economic uh, situation and the recent change in gas. Okay. Okay, so now, but let, like let, I said, this is my opinion. So security experts may have their say, but that is my opinion. Okay, let me let me um, put it into perspective, taking a context from where you just landed with regards to changing guards. Now, are you actually referring to changing guard nationally or um, subnationally in, let's say, Abuja, for instance? So if I let me rephrase and then put it, like I said, into perspective, what you said. So are you going to say that um, the change in guard or uh, the that's the appointment or uh, of um, um, the new landlord of Abuja, that's the FCT of Abuja, the minister, rather, I, I beg your pardon, the minister of the FCT, could have led to the incessant and the surge in insecurity, kidnapping, banditry, one chance, armed robbery that we find in FCT? Is that what you, exactly what you mean? Not, not at all. Not at all. My message had nothing to do with the Federal Capital Territory Minister. I'm talking about the military structure itself and the police security institutions. Not uh, the minister of the Federal Capital Territory is just an appointee of the president. He's just a minister of the Federal Republic. He has nothing to do with security of the Federal Capital Territory, so to say. Because he doesn't command any of the military structures. Many any of the uh, security structures is not under his command. So I wasn't referring to to the Federal Capital Territory Minister. I was talking about the change in guard that happened in the army, and the police, immigration, uh, uh, customs, civil defense, and all that. Okay. Okay, so now I, I hear some people write on social media and make some statements saying that, okay, now we have, um, we actually thought that the insecurity, especially in the FCT, would have reduced now that we have um, the FCT minister and then he's um, a no-nonsense person. But then we've seen how much it has increased. Yeah. And then I read something on social media. I'll, I'll ask the producer. No, like I said, as, like as, I said, as I can. Like as I said, I that is a wrong. So that's, that's what oh, I'm trying on, to make. Me... I, I want us to, to actually demystify and to um, make people understand. Because most people believe that since we already have a new minister, it means that we should not be seeing this. But, but since it is happening, it means that he is not working. So that's what I want us to make people understand, that um, that's not what it it's is. It's not his job. It's mm. not his job. It's not his job. They are hanging the wrong team. He's the wrong uh, corporate. He is not the... 
the chief security officer of the Federal Capital Territory. I keep telling you this, even the state governors, when we say they are chief security officers of the states, mm. it is just a title. It is not the real operational word. Operationally, the government can, the federal, the, federal, mm, the federal government has overall control of security in the country, whether the state level or in the federal level, because we don't have state police. The most a governor can do is to form a vigilante group. And most of these vigilante groups, some of them have cases in courts challenging their legality. Okay. And there's a limit to the arms they can carry. They cannot carry the kind of arms that the police, the military are allowed to carry. So there's a limit to what they can do. So the Federal Capital Territory Minister cannot be held responsible for the security in Abuja, so to say. Mm. All right. It's no nonsense, yes, but there are other areas that he is called upon to perform, infrastructure, Abuja Master Plan, let's, so to say, he is to implement the Abuja Master Plan, tax collection, internal uh, generated revenue, traffic control, uh, beautification, railways, water supply, road maintenance, housing and infrastructure, development control. In fact, his hand is full with those mm. things. So security is not one of them the federal government controls the security this is where this president is sitting mm. so the national intelligence agency the the presidential guard and all of those people are in Abuja. they should secure the city we don't want to wake up one day and hear that the president is kidnapped All right. Before we leave um, security matters, now we've seen um, the story of um, uh, those who were kidnapped, and then at some point, uh, one of them who was a student, their family was uh, members of their family were kidnapped, and then at the end of the day, the kidnappers demanded a ransom, and they were not able to pay all. They paid some, but yet they were killed. Is even when they were like crowdfunding. And then people brought money together to ensure that their person was released. So you have some people who would say that this crowdfunding, are you sure that is not now a new way of um, uh, these kidnappers now knowing that, okay, so they can now, is, is that going to be, or should we be um, worried about the fact that crowdfunding might now even be a new access or it should be stopped immediately? Yeah, it's worrisome. It's worrisome, but you see, uh, these things are easier said than done. When you are a family member of someone who is kidnapped, it's difficult for you to listen to such suggestions because all you, all you are thinking is your family member should be set free. So it's difficult for people to stop crowdfunding, to pay ransom, to gain freedom of their family members who are kidnapped. But let me tell you something that happened in Benue that stopped kidnapping of reverend fathers. Mm. There was a time the church became a target of kidnappers here in Benue. They were picking uh, reverend fathers and reverend pastors, knowing fully well that the church will contribute money and uh, pay for their rescue. So the churches met the bishop gave an instruction that henceforth, any reverend father that is uh, kidnapped, those kidnappers should kill the person because they are not going to pay one dime. So once they are kidnapping the reverend father, they should just make sure that they are killing the person straight away. And those, uh, the key such way should only be, we only be treated like meters. So uh, immediately the kidnappers got to know that uh, the church is bad business. Mm. They stopped 
picking them up. Oh. So there is an incentive for crime. There is an incentive for crime. Crime happens when there is opportunity. Mm. There is an object, and then uh, there is a desire. Okay. Okay. This triangle must meet. When there is a desire, there is an object, and then there is an opportunity. Once you remove one of these, crime will not happen. So what the bishop did was to remove the object. The desire was not there again because if you kidnap a reverend father, nothing for you. It's bad business. Mm. So obviously there's no motivation again. Okay. So if we can bear the pain of losing one or two persons, but we refuse to pay ransom no matter what. After four or three uh, attempts, they will stop because it's no more lucrative. Oh, wow. In a business, a business that is not bringing profit, why do you continue doing it? So, it is a way to stop it, but it's a painful way because when you are in the shoes of the families who are uh, victims of this kidnap, you will know that it's difficult to listen to that uh, advice, not to pay ransom. All right. But that is the sure solution because this kidnapping started small, small. Mm -hmm. And many people were now seeing it as a lucrative business. They jump in. But once they stop paying ransom, it will stop. But as right. long as we contribute money to pay, it will continue. All right, now let's um, let's um, go to other matters and talk about fighting corruption or anti-corruption, whichever one um, name that rings a bell to you at the moment. We've seen how some people term it as um, there's this new wind of anti-corruption that's been blowing for a few days and it's been um, catching up with so many government officials, um, um, public officers and all. And that's why you see that some people would... Um, they're being appointed a few months later. They're being thrown out of the window, shown the way um, out. What are your thoughts in that regard? Let's start in that regard. Do you actually see the um, administration or uh, governance of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu um, with this fight or this uh, in, um, in continuous fighting corruption? Do you actually think that it's a we good way to go? It's a good way to start a new year, 2024? And also, do you think that it will be um, sustained? That's, I'm, I'm sure I'm asking like too many questions in, in, and I'd like to take them in one breath. Will it be sustained? Is it a good way to go? And also, do you think that it is cutting across board and not um, cherry picking? Okay, uh, let me start by saying that every little step taken by anybody at all to fight corruption should be appreciated. Mm. So to that extent, I, I want to appreciate the fact that the president acted swiftly uh, to suspend one of the ministers who was accused of uh, doing something appropriate uh, it is rare to see that speed uh, from a president in Nigeria. Even Buhari that came with uh, a mantra of fighting corruption wasn't swift in addressing such issues when it concerned his cabinet uh, ministers and appointees. So to that extent, I think the president acted in the right manner. Whether it is going to be sustained is a different matter, which I will allow time to tell. But so far, so good. I think he acted in the right way. Now, let's, let's look at the issue at hand itself. 
the question of the uh, Minister for Humanitarian uh, Affairs. The minister to me is a victim of the system we have created. Did you say victim? And this system, yes, I use that word deliberately and I'm going to explain. If you give me time, I will explain. Please go ahead. Okay, fine. You see, we have built a terrible system in this country over the years. Uh, if you look at the age bracket where the minister is coming from, she is from this generation of, uh, let me say, Yahoo, Yahoo generation. And these are the generations that wrote examinations in special centers. These are generation of uh, Nigerians that bought their way through academics. This is a generation that sees nothing wrong with corruption. This is a generation that is born inside corruption. And when they act, they genuinely believe that they are acting in the right context of the environment where they operate. But I thought that accusation are for so, the Gen Zs. She's not a Gen Z. So, so, so let me land. I'm, I'm making a very profound point here. And if we miss it, I want Nigerians to hear this. Because I have been singing it over the years. That Nigeria is not going to be better off in the hands of the youth of today. When they become leaders in the future, Nigeria will not be better off. Because we have built a generation that believes corruption is normal. We have built a generation that believes that once you are in a position of power, you exploit as much as you can. It is your turn. Now you remember the president, the current president said it was his turn. Did you understand what that meant? Meant what? What he meant? it was his turn he never explained that so it could mean many things so some of the ministers he appointed also believe it is their turn to do exactly what the previous government was doing and even do more so the lady may have sincerely thought he was doing she was doing something right this is the way it is done she has an opportunity to do it the way she likes and nobody will question her. It is the outcry from the public that led the president to act. So the president may very well be on a, a damage control uh, mission. It may just be a damage control. That's why I said, let's leave it the sustainability. Time should tell us. But it is a knee-jerk response to the outcry when this thing happened. So you have a situation where previous ministers have done worse things and gotten away with it. So in her mind, she will even be asking, why me? Why are they picking on me when it is just uh, some few millions? People have stolen billions and they are working free. Just recently, you had a minister, a minister under Buhari, he launched a non-existing airline. He went to Ethiopia, borrowed an aircraft, branded it in the logo of the airline, flew it into Abuja, commissioned an airline, and the, the aircraft flew back to Ethiopia the next day. That man is still a free man. So when Beta Edu looks at herself, she will see herself as a victim. Why are they picking on her when she has not even stolen the money yet? He only transferred it to somebody's account. He has not been established that the money was actually stolen. But here is a man that did 419 on the whole country. Launched an existing airline in broad daylight. And nothing happened to him. 
So this is the system we have built. And the better angels of this world, of this generation, they see nothing wrong with it. They feel it is their turn. That's why I mentioned, I made the mention of the word victim okay. at the beginning. It is not in the sense that somebody is victimizing her, but I just feel that the system has produced her. Now she is being shamed by flowing in the system that she believes is the right way to go. Okay. So, so a Nigeria must redevelop a value system. Our value system must change. Otherwise, we continue seeing the government. 1999, we had one Salih Subuhari who was 29 years old, became the speaker of the, the house. You, you, you know the scandal that happened around him. Just recently, we had a young uh, uh, leader of the EFCC, the chairman of the EFCC, also in status. You are aware of the scandals around him. So the younger generation will not even do better. We keep saying not too young to rule, but we have not been primed over the years to do better than the older generation. So the future of our country is, 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 is bleak. Hmm. I will take you back to what you stated when you said um, she is not, it has not been confirmed that the money was stolen because it was just uh, some few millions, not billions like some other persons have. So are you actually saying that it is okay to transfer public funds to private purse? Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is right now the money is sitting somewhere remember they said the money was meant for some states mm. to be distributed so if the money was moved to that account it is still in that account it's a known account okay so you move money from point a to point b you have not spent it okay but that's a, just the point i'm trying to say make that the money is there, the money is still there. It has not been established whether they moved out the money to spend it on their personal uh, uh, needs yet. Okay, that is the subject of investigation. The EFCC will determine what happened to the money when it was moved. But the act of moving the money itself to that account is not legal. Okay? Mm. I want, I want to draw a line between two things. Moving that money is one thing. Stealing it is a different thing. So oh. if they have moved the money, yes, I'm trying to look at it two ways. The money has already been moved, yet. yes. But has the money been spent, which is what the EFCC will, will determine, how it was spent. Let's assume they moved that money and they actually transferred it to the right recipients through that account. We, are we going to say the money was stolen? Did okay. you get my question? I, yes, yes, I get Let's you. Let's assume... Get you, but but now, let, let, me, yeah. let me put it again into context. Let's say you have a private business and um, some supplies were made and the, your customer, your clients, um, wants to pay in money to one of your staff. And then the staff provides his own individual account so that the money should be paid into the individual account instead of the company's account. Are you saying there's nothing wrong because money has been uh, uh, at least... No, no, there's something, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. I've said clearly that... But that is one offense. Standing alone. That's a standalone offense. Okay. Stealing is another offense. So assuming this staff collects the money and then hands it over to the company, are you still going to say she stole the money? But why make your individual account available in the first place? Oh. If you're dealing for with whatever company. reason, sorry, I'm having I'm under the weather, so my voice and uh, I'm not uh, too uh, comfortable. But let's continue. 
So, so what I'm saying is, let's distinguish two distinct events here and call them by their proper name. You receive money through the wrong account. That is a wrong act. You spend the money for the wrong reason. That's another wrong act. Okay. They are standing apart. So what I'm saying is, they are committed one offense. Let's wait and see whether a second offense is committed. Okay? The first offense has been committed, but are we going to say the money has been stolen? That is another thing that the EFCC needs to establish. All right. Let's go on a quick break. I hope I'm clear. Return. We, we, yes, we, we need to go on a break. We're actually due for a break. Let's go on a quick break, uh, viewers, and when we return, we'll continue this conversation with Engineer Teve Atza. I will see you after this timeout. Do join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation, reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed out on the first part of the show, but then you can still join us as my guest on the show tonight is Engineer Teve Atza, who is um, the former governorship aspirant in PDP, who is um, contesting to become um, the governor of Benue State. Okay, so before we went on that break, we we're still talking about um, the anti-corruption allegations on um, the former or oh, the suspended humanitarian minister. But now let me ask you, still um, around that same uh, matter, why exactly do you think that um, that um, department or that ministry that is supposed to be um, to save lives of people has been seen over time as a means of dispensing cash or like a cash cow for a lot of people and then it doesn't get to um the grassroots because if you remember recently the president that's bola ametinubu even um suspended or stopped the um, farmer money trader money all those uh, money monies that went to the wrong hands why exactly do you think that that ministry has been seen as such and what should be done so that the next person who is going to head the ministry, or, or even if the minister is being um, uh, reinstated back, there's, there should be this mentality that humanitarian ministry is not um, a, an avenue to make money. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but let me say that every government has that one ministry where it is a conduit for stealing. If you go back to all the governments since 1999, there's always one ministry or even two where it is a conduit, strictly a conduit for stealing money. During Jonathan, we had the amnesty program. That became their conduit. Anything that was pushed into amnesty was not accounted for. It was for security and all that. Um, in Buhari government also, the same uh, issue of palliatives came up. You remember when COVID-19 happened? Mm. COVID and palliative. up to today, you are still hearing that the money that was meant for COVID-19 uh, was paid, stockpiled, and people were stealing it the way they like. Mm. Just recently, there's a memo from the chief of staff uh, to this same lady, authorizing the use of three billion from the COVID money. That means the money is sitting somewhere. People are using it the way they like, not accounted for. The money was meant for palliatives during COVID nineteen, but they are giving approval now that they should use three billion out of that money to verify the list of beneficiaries. How can you use three billion just to verify a list? What kind of verification are you doing that you need three billion? So these things are happening, but the problem in Nigeria is that we like mob action. When you steal and you are not caught, you are a good man. So the mistake you make is that you allow yourself to be caught. Oh, wow. You become, a, a, yeah, the, the people will mob you. 
But in the individual spaces, even in the other ministries, if you open up what is happening, you will see uh, it will be more terrible than what uh, we are seeing in the case of humanitarian uh, ministry. But the problem is that she allowed herself to be caught. So is that her crime? So I, hear Nigeria, people, I hear people make that statement, say her, when her, you her challenge is because she was caught. She allowed herself to be caught. Yes, yes. Yes, because she allowed herself to be caught. Oh. Yeah? So when you see smartly, people celebrate you. You can even go to church and give thanksgiving. Churches invite you. You take over the pulpit. I remember she was at a church. I think his winner's chapel some months after his, uh, some weeks after his uh, uh, inauguration as minister to give thanksgiving to the church. Who knows how much she gave there as tight or thanksgiving offering from the same money. So let's stop deceiving ourselves. We're all thieves. In most of the ministries, they are stealing. They are stealing. It's one way when they catch you that they, they victimize you and they make you a, 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 a spectacle. So that's what's happening to her. And any other ministry, if you go and put a binoculars in the ministry, you will see a lot of things happening. And that's the system we have built over time. All right, let's move to other matters and discuss um, uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's um, decision to move some part or some department and offices of the Central Bank of Nigeria to Lagos, which has actually caused quite a number of hue and cry. You have people who say that uh, it's all shades of wrong. Even the deputy, the former deputy governor of um, the Central Bank has come out to say that it is um, all shades and all color of wrong. And then some other persons have lent their voice to it. What are your thoughts in that regard? I know that the Central Bank has branches all over the country, but I'm not too sure what exactly has happened in this case. So I wouldn't want to comment whether it's wrong or right, but what is the motive? Is there a law against it? Those are the things we should establish. Why, we, why is the government just realizing that that has to, do, to be done now? Why is it when President Tinubu is in power? Why is it done under his presidency? So those are the questions. Is there some uh, sectional interest? Nigerians are always bound to ask uh, questions along uh, sectional and religious uh, lines. So is it acting simply because he wants those things to move to Lagos or because he's from Lagos State? Those are the questions, but I'm not too sure of anything. In that regard, so I will, I will just stop there. Mm. All right, before we let you go, two questions, and I'd like you to take them together. One is with regards to um, the recent Supreme Court judgment on some of the state governors and their the rulings that were given. But you have for Plato State, you have for um, other states also. What are your thoughts in that regard? And then I remember yesterday, um, the governor of um, Imo State was sworn in, and then you have so many people who still I feel disgruntled, and they still have some other um, aspirants who are still in court, who say they still want to go to court, they also feel disgruntled, even with the Supreme Court judgment from River State and some other states also. What are your thoughts in this regard? And then secondly, we'd like, you to, we'd like to get your last word with regards to fighting or anti-corruption, whichever way, either fighting corruption or staying in the lane of anti-corruption. How do we make this work? In 2024, if we say we want to go headlong to bring down everyone who has their hands in the cookie jar, how far do we need to go and ensure that it moves across board, be it in any department or any ministry or MDA at all? I don't want to start mentioning you, but how do we go in that regard? Okay, you asked two questions. The Supreme Court judge judgments and mm. the cor corruption, where do we go? Okay. Uh, when, when you listen to politicians, every judgment that the court gives, you will have the opposing side and the other side having an opinion. So it's difficult to gauge whether the judgment was correct or not 
listening to politicians. Because when it favors them, the judiciary becomes the last hope of the common man. When it doesn't favor them, they say the judiciary has been bought over. So it is never here or there. So the Supreme Court, in their wisdom, has given judgments, and they are the last court in the land. My opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. So it is what it is. So let everybody go back and maintain what the court has uh, instructed. For those who were un uh, favored, that is their luck. For those who lost out, they should wait and try again in the future. Maybe it will be their luck. Coming to, to the anti-corruption fight, like I told you earlier, whether President Tinubu will sustain it remains to be seen because a lot of things needs to be done if we are going to get it right. The bureaucracy around government alone takes a chunk of our money that could go into the economy and make our lives better. He has to start cutting down all sorts of things around government. You remember he has the biggest ministry, I mean, the biggest list of ministers. He, cre he, he created ministries that are not even supposed to be there. What is blue economy, for instance? When we have a... Do you actually have a problem with the blue economy? I, not a problem, but it's unnecessary. These are nice to have. Oh, really? These are nice to have. Because, because the more ministries you create, the more ministers. Okay, 40-something ministers is way too high. Don't you see it as the more Nigeria. revenue also? Revenue from where? From those ministries. The more the revenue. Like the one Not you just necessary. mentioned, the Ministry if of the Blue Economy. Two plus two is four. Two plus two is four. Okay. So if I have four and I fragment it into two, I still have two. two. No difference. Mathematically. It doesn't translate to anything more. It only increases bureaucracy. It increases the number of official vehicles we are going to buy. It increases the number of convoys we are going to have on our roads. If it increases the extra calls we are going to pay to government officials. So it leads to more waste. Whatever you are saying will come in, will also be wasted to maintain the lifestyle of these people who are appointed into position. So if you want to fight corruption, you need to deal with bureaucracy and also reform the civil service. All right. Because most corruption uh, happens in the ministries. Mm. That is why the memos are written to justify expenditures. So whatever expenditure they want to justify, it's just for a permanent secretary to sign a memo. And that thing will happen. And you and I will not even know. That's why year in, year out, we had trillions of uh, money allocated in budget. At the end of the year, nobody sees where the money has gone. And then we start talking about next year budget. Because bulk of it is stolen. So this one right. action that the uh, president has done is not enough for me to say there's a corruption fight ongoing yet. It's not enough yet. Ah, okay. We need to see more. That's what I'm saying. All right, before we let you go, I hear you talk about um, those who feel aggrieved or disgruntled with um, regards to the formal, the recent election that they should try their luck again. I'll bring that question to you personally. Are you trying your luck again? 2027? <laughs> Let's get to the bridge. We'll cross it. Now you're talking like a politician. <laughs> and in I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on my ambition. Okay. I still want to be governor of Ben someday. So we'll see you but on the whether it's 2027, or, whether it's 2027 or later on, I can't tell. But all I know is that I am still on the line. Okay. So when we get to that time, it will be obvious. Okay. <laughs>
Edina Tewe as a formal um, governorship aspirant in Benue State. Thank you so much for your time with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, viewers, that's all we can take for today. Thank you so much for listening. We have been chatting with Engineer Teve Atsa, who is a formal governorship aspirant for PDP in Benue State. And it's been a wonderful time here on D Conversation. Whatever you do, ensure that you do not get your hands in the cookie jar, whether you, you're caught or you're not caught. Please do not engage in corruption. They are still legal and legit ways of making money, of making legit money, something like what I'm doing or something like a very good legit business. Anyways, I'll see you next time. My name is Annabelle Oji. Good evening. Have a very wonderful evening. My name still remains Annabelle Oji again. <laughs>